Good afternoon. Welcome to the first webinar of 2011, continuing our series from MBF Bioscience. My name is Susan Hendricks. As a staff scientist, I also run the day-to-day -day operations of MBF Labs, a contract research facility for stereology here at MBF. I'm joined today by Michael Fay, software engineer, who developed the integration for the Apatome soft, or device within our software. Today we'll be demonstrating how to use the Apatome module in Neurolucida or Stereo Investigator. The webinar will last 60 minutes and is divided into four topics. The goal for today's webinar is to provide a practical demonstration of using the Apatome to create confocal-like images. There will be a short break after each topic where we will address questions that have been submitted via the question window. If you have additional questions that were not addressed by the conclusion of the presentation, please send your questions to info at mbfbioscience.com and we'll respond to you directly. Integrating the Apatome with your Zeiss epifluorescent microscope will permit you to capture high-quality confocal-like images using your wide-field light source. So today we're going to discuss briefly what structured illumination is and how it works. And then we'll move right on to using the, cal the Apatome within our software. We'll show you how to calibrate it and then also how to create images, image stacks, 2D virtual slices, and 3D virtual tissue images using Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida. Finally, we'll show you how to adjust the images to improve the viewing as well as uh, show how the analysis can be done on these new Apatome images. If you haven't seen what the Apatome can do, it's actually pretty impressive. In each image, we've collected a wide field image stack first, visible here as the upper left. Then, by only inserting the Apatome device into the reflected light path, captured an image stack where the out-of-focus light has been removed. Now we will present the main components of an Apatome system from MBF Bioscience. The Apatome is designed as an add-on to the Axio Imager and Axio Observer lines of microscopes from Zeiss. The Apatome itself is comprised of two main components. A control box, which you can see on the left next to the microscope stand, this connects to either your computer or directly to the microscope. Also, the Apatome slider, which connects to the control box and fits in the field diaphragm slot of the microscope. A high bit depth digital camera is required for structured illumination as the extra dynamic range is particularly important here. We will be removing a significant amount of out-of-focus light from the scenes you will be imaging. Additionally, you will need a motorized stage. This allows you to take advantage of the sophisticated software tools available in Stereo Investigator and Neurolucida for navigating and analyzing your tissue samples. The Apatome and all of our imaging tools operate the same in either of these applications. Today, we will be using a pre-release version 10, which will be available soon. Here is a nice animation of the Apatome at work, graciously provided by the folks at Zeiss. This shows what you will see in live video with the Apatome we have set up and is now ready for calibration. There are two positions for the Apatome when it is in place on the microscope. Position 1 presents an iris diaphragm and the reflected light path for standard wide field mode imaging.
Position two presents the grid insert, which projects the grid pattern onto your specimen for apatome mode imaging. You switch between the two positions by physically moving the slider. In position one, the slider is partially out of the F-slot. In position two, for apatome mode, the slider is fully inserted. You will hear a beep when the apatome is in place. When the apatome is in position two, you will see the grid pattern wobbling. This helps keep bleaching of the sample even to reduce the risk of residual grid lines in your apatome images. I would also like to recommend to those interested to read this paper from Tony Wilson's group at Oxford. This is an early paper on structured illumination and goes into detail about the theory and mathematics involved in this particular strategy. Now we can illustrate structured illumination imaging with the Zeiss apatome. The strategy is to capture three or more wide field images with the grid pattern projected into the focal plane of the objective. These component images are then analyzed, out of focus light is removed with the grid lines, and the final image you see is comprised of only in focus light. Now have a look at this component image. Outlined in yellow is an example of a region containing out of focus light. This light will be removed from the final image. Notice the washed out grid lines. That is the indicator for light to be removed from the scene. In green is an example of a region that is primarily in focus. Little, if any, of the light from this region will be removed from the final image. You can see, as we move through component images, the grid is translated for each capture. Now have a look at the final optical section created by removing the out-of-focus light. Notice the light from the yellow region is now gone, and that from the green region made it to the final image. For comparison, here is the wide field image of the same scene. The image quality improvement is quite dramatic. Okay, let's pause for a moment and uh, answer any questions you have about structured illumination concepts that we just covered. Please submit your questions via the question window. Someone has asked if we must use a monochrome camera. The answer is yes. You also need the camera to be high bit depth for the extra dynamic range. Someone has asked if there is a minor vibration during image capture, would the imaging be affected seriously? Ideally, you'll have a very stable system. If the grid moves imprecisely, which would likely be the case if your system was moving, your final image quality would be affected dramatically and you would have strong residual grid lines. You can use a, a vibration isolation platform or an anti-vibration table to help limit any uh, environmental vibration that gets translated to your microscope. We're also asked whether or not you can use uh, Neurolucida with the apatome, and the answer is yes. Uh, as long as you have a Zeiss epifluorescent microscope of the Axio Imager or Axio Observer series, uh, Z1 or M1, Z2 or M2. We've been asked about the, the depth of the in-focus field at 60x, for example. The depth of field, typically with the optimal grid insert for the apatome, will be in the neighborhood of one micron. 
There are tricks and tips, however, for changing the section thickness by changing the grid insert that you use. The three grid inserts have three different frequencies of the grid pattern, and by changing them, you can increase or decrease section thickness from the optimal. Okay, let's move on. Uh, please feel free to continue submitting your questions, and as uh, we have time and, and they slide into the, the discussion, we'll add them in. So before you get started, there's a number of things that you need to ensure that you do. First of all, uh, all the software calibrations that are required for normative use of Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida are required. You need to ensure that your camera is aligned, you have proper lens scaling, the movements of your stage are correct, and that you have performed par-centric and par-focal calibration. In addition, to use the Apatome, which is only available through Zeiss, you need to calibrate it as well. There are two phases, two portions of calibration, phase calibration and grid focus. Using the mirrored calibration slide that comes with your apatome setup, first find the crosshairs and focus on them. This ensures that you are focused at the very top of the slide and ready to begin the calibration routine. When you have brought the grid lines into focus, you are ready to run the phase calibration. In this sample image, you see nice high contrast grid pattern on the screen. Just make sure you have selected the grid, which is currently installed in your slider, and click the Fast button on the lower left of the Apatome dialog. In this step, the software is learning how to move the grid as we acquire component images. This is necessary to properly identify all of the out-of-focus light and remove the grid lines when we build the final optical section. Since the system is currently calibrated, will not perform one at this time. Next, we need to learn how to focus the grid for each objective and filter combination. As you will see later, this is very important in the process of acquiring multi-channel images. You will want to do these calibrations over a region or with a slide that is not precious to avoid bleaching your most important tissue. Now we have the Apatome slider in position. We will bring up the Apatome dialog by going to the Options menu, the Microscope Setup submenu, and selecting Apatome. Using the slider control in the grid focus box, you can see the grid lines come in and out of focus. Find the grid focus position with the sharpest contrast of the grid pattern. This looks good to me. Notice the high contrast grid lines. We'll acquire an image. This looks very nice to me. I am happy with this grid focus position, so I'll save it to my collection for use later in device command sequences. Click on the cabinet button. Click edit presets. And you can save this grid focus position by typing in a name appropriate for your objective and filter combination. 
Then just click Save. This system is calibrated. You can see in our cabinet, we have a full set of objective, filter, grid focus combinations that we have saved for future use. So that's the, uh, the basics for calibration. So to summarize, you want to make sure that the grid selection in the software is matched to what is installed in the device prior to phase calibration. Additionally, you need to calibrate the apatome's movement, the focus, to each objective filter combination. After the break, we're going to discuss how to create device command sequences to facilitate acquisition. We're going to pause now to answer some of the questions that you've provided through the question window. You're a very active group. We love it. We've been asked how stable is the calibration from session to session. The calibration should last quite some time. Weeks, if not months. You will notice when your calibration is insufficient, residual grid lines may start appearing in your images. If that is the case, you'll want to re redo the phase calibration. If you notice your grid focus has declined in quality, when you go to your saved grid focus positions, you may also want to readjust those positions and save over the old. Those can vary from staining protocol to staining protocol. So uh, once you have them set, they should be stable. But when you switch stains, it might be different. If you purchase an Apatome uh, with Stair Investigator or Neurolucida, our installation team will perform these calibrations, the phase and focus calibrations, so that uh, you will be able to immediately start using your system. The calibration does not need to be done each time you image. In fact, you'll set it once, and then it should remain uh, suitable for multiple imaging sessions. Kamari wants to know if he can if they can create a three-dimensional image of a neuron. We're going to demonstrate that a little bit later, right? In fact, in the next session. So hang on, we'll get right to it. In your Apatome setup, you'll have a special filter cube. This is purely for phase calibration of the Apatome system. That is the only time you'll use this filter cube. And you use it with the mirror slide only. Uh, we're asked if the procedures will differ if one is using the workstation version of Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida. You can only use this device when it's connected to the microscope. So a workstation license of Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida, because they do not control hardware, will not be uh, appropriate for imaging. You have to use the, the full version of Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida. The procedures for imaging and calibrating the apatome are exactly the same in Neurolucida and Stereo Investigator. We're working with Stereo Investigator for this webinar. Okay, well let's, let's do some imaging. Before we get started, we need to talk about device command sequences. Device command sequences integrate all the hardware together to orchestrate the image capture. In the multi-channel control window, you'll see that each of the multi-channel uh, acquires, in this case we're going to do red, green, and blue, have an associated set of commands that are specified and created in the device command sequence editor. You can see my naming convention, which indicates the objective filter and the fact that it's for the apatome, is indicated in the name so that I can easily identify which filter combination I need to employ for my multi-channel acquires. You want to make sure that the Remember Video Settings box is checked. And to create a sequence to easily switch between wide field and apatome operations, make sure you've got a simple device command sequence set up for, a single, for the single filter without the objective and apatome device um, specified. A wide field device command sequence for the Zeiss should look like this. In this case, we're requesting that the motorized shutter be closed. The filter position in the uh, turret is moved to the GFP cube. Then we're going to ask for the shutter to open. And these synchronizer steps are to ensure that the Q 
communication between the microscope and our software has completed prior to moving on to the next step. This is especially important at this last step to ensure that all commands have been done before the camera acquires its image. To look at an apatome device command sequence, you'll notice that only one thing has changed in that we are including the apatome device in our device command sequence. And for the state, we're going to select the uh, objective filter calibration for the apatome that we set up in the apatome setup dialog box. So that filing cabinet that we created before. And so you will create a device command sequence for each combination of objective and filter combination for everything that you've done so far. So let's make it happen. We're going to go to live mode. We, we showed how to acquire a single image during the calibration process, but now let's acquire a three-channel image. I've selected my device command sequence. I'm at imaging at 20x, and I'm in the hippocampus. The red channel, the Psi-3, is uh, acetylcholine transferase. So we're looking at cholinergic fibers in red. We'll be looking at uh, GFP transgenic neurons. They've been uh, um, under a Thigh-1 promoter. And then we also have DAPI. You want to extend the range in your camera histogram so that it is as broad as possible without oversaturation. To do that, you can increase the exposure or, or also adjust the gain. Again, ensuring that you don't oversaturate the image. So we're going to dial this back a little bit. And so here's our, our first multi-channel acquire with the apatome. Notice that this is an area of the tissue. I've, I've outlined the hippocampus here. And in this particular portion of the section, there's a tear, which is perfect for calibration, for ensuring that my uh, settings are, are correct. Let's contrast this with a wide field image and see what the difference in quality is. In the image acquisition window, I'm going to select live image. And I'm going to change the device command sequences here in the, in the multi-channel control box. So instead of having the apatome device, I'm going to select just the um, device command sequences that are necessary for each channel. I have three channels to acquire. Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida can acquire up to six channels simultaneously. You can also alternate the order in which the channels are acquired. And we also have selected to acquire the channels for a multi-channel image stack, a stack at a time. What this will entail is that all images for the red channel will be acquired, then all of the green, and then all of the blue. Under the All Acquires tab, there are a couple things that I like to ensure I use. I ensure that the, after every acquire operation, the shutter is closed. This prevents any inadvertent leaching that may occur. Additionally, after acquiring an image stack, I'll request the shutter to close. And before focus, which is an important operation for um, SRS image stack acquires or virtual slice or virtual tissue, I'm going to request that the DAPI channel is uh, moved into position. And after I'm done with that operation, again, I'm going to ask for the filter to close. I'm going to acquire a quick image. And I did not adjust the camera settings for the wide field image here. So let's, uh, let's go back and adjust the images real quick. So again, we do not want to oversaturate the image. But we want the histogram to be as broad as possible. Mm 
Okay, that's still a little too bright, so I'll bring it down just a smidge. Okay, let's acquire this image and we can compare it to the apatome image we just acquired. Okay, here's our wide field image. And let's take a look at the apatome image of the same region. You can see that a majority of the out-of-focus light has just simply been removed from the apatome image, producing very crisp, clear indications of, of what's in focus at a given focal plane. Oh, I'm pointing with me. Notice down here a cell in the wide field image that is below the depth of the optical section of the focal plane is uh, coming through in the wide field image but is removed for the apatome. Somebody asked what the blue star is on the image. That's actually not part of the image. This is just a location marker so Susan can jump around to regions she's previously looked at. In my macro view window, you'll see that I've outlined the entire hippocampus on this section. And I've placed a couple of markers as uh, codes for me to know where to go. And so in this case, the blue star is where I'm going to do my, my initial imaging. And then we're going to move over here to do some high quality images. So let's do uh, an image stack just to show you how that process goes. In wide field, since we have that available, we're going to focus on the top of the section. And this section is approximately 20 microns thick, so I'm going to acquire five images distri uh, distributed through a stack height of 18 microns. When you're doing uh, image acquisitions, not only for stacks, but also for virtual slides and virtual tissues, it's important that you scroll through the tissue to get a feel for how the staining changes as you go through the section thickness. As these cell bodies come into focus, they're going to be brighter uh, when they're in crisp focus than above or below the, the section. So you just want to make sure that your dynamic range isn't, isn't pegged. So we're going to acquire a quick virtual image, or virtual uh, image stack. Okay, and now let's put the apatome into the light path. Change our device command sequences. Put a live image, and now we're going to check the exposure settings, again, through the section thickness. I hope you can see how the grid lines are moving as uh, the grid is being translated across the section. And this looks nice and broad without being overexposed, so that's good. Excellent. Okay, let's come back. We're going to acquire the same region with uh, the apatome now in place instead of out of the focal point. Okay, so here's our apatome image stack, and you can see as I tab through the image planes by using page up and page down, you can see the cells come in and out of focus. If we contrast that with the wide field view, you can see that there isn't a whole lot of change in the same depth um, as, as there was with the apatome image stack.
indicating that a lot of out-of-focus light is being removed from, from the apatome image. Finally, the last sequence that I'm going to show live is uh, we're going to move to my other pre-selected spot. That one. And we'll capture some uh, 3D virtual tissue. To do this, I'm going to first go up in magnification. So we're going to image this at 63x. So I need to apply my immersion oil. And I need to change my device command sequences. So now I need to adjust those look nice. So there are fibers. Because I know there are cells in here, I want to ensure that my uh, uh, exposure is not going to overexpose these guys during the time of acquisition. They look quite nice. Close the shutter and set up the virtual tissue. So this is a version 10, remember, this is pre-release, so in a, you'll shortly be able to get this version of the software. We're going to select Acquire Virtual Tissue from the Acquisition menu. And I'm going to do a quick 2 by 2 because our time here is limited. I'll give it a name. and right-click and select Start Virtual Slice Scan. So while we wait for this to finish capturing, uh, let's continue our discussion. Someone was asked about applying this technique to wide-field images which were captured previously. For this particular strategy to work, the grid pattern needs to be projected into the focal plane of the objective during acquisition time. So you do need to do this live. I'd like to talk about a couple of optional settings available on the Apatome dialog. The first one is optical section quality. There are four settings available from fast acquire to best quality. A fast acquire uses three component images. Each increment and in quality setting adds more component images to the final optical section. The best quality uses nine images. Here we have an example of an image captured with the fast acquire setting. You'll notice it's a little bit grainy. We're not entirely happy with this. So we change to the best quality optical section and reacquire the image. you'll see a much smoother, nice, bright image. We're very happy with this. We got improved quality. The trade-off was a longer acquisition time. In this case, three times as long, gathering nine component images rather than three. I'd also like to mention the spatially adaptive bleaching correction filter available. This is particularly, particularly useful when you've been imaging a region for quite some time and grid lines have started to bleach into the tissue sample. You'll see here, 
we're starting to get residual grid lines in our final optical sections that we weren't getting earlier. So we turn on the SABC filter. In this case, we selected the medium. There is also a weak and strong filter. Recapture the image, and you see a much smoother final optical section. The same region no longer has any residual grid lines. So when you're imaging, some of the things to keep in mind are to maximize your dynamic range without overexposure. If necessary, you can increase the gain in order to reduce the exposure time. Bleaching correction can help to remove residual grid lines that have been burned into the tissue. And the optical section quality increases the total time required to generate an image, but that might be just what you need to get the data you need. So let's pause and address questions that have been posted during this session. Oh, Sanjeev asks um, if we recommend capturing a stack in each channel, so a stack at a time, or all three channels at each Z. The, uh, it'll depend on what your, your image analysis requires. Uh, you can do um, stack at a time for speed, because there's less movement of the turret. The acquisition time will be shortened. Uh, an advantage of doing a, a three-channel acquire at each Z before you move to the next uh, Z position means that each of those three images, red, green, and blue, for example, um, at that Z will be acquired where there won't be any, any potential slippage. So if you've got a nice tight uh, Z, internal Z motor, then you can probably just do stack at a time and, and shorten your total acquisition time. If you notice that there's any drift in your system, you may want to do the three channels um, before moving to the next Z position to ensure that they're all at the same optical plane. We're asked what the difference is between virtual slice and virtual tissue. Virtual slice is a 2D image montage, and virtual tissue we're calling a 3D image montage. So virtual tissue is the assembly of multiple image stacks together to create a three-dimensional reconstruction, image reconstruction of, of your area of interest. Someone asked about the three settings on the SABC filter and why I didn't use the strong filter. In general, I like to use the minimum amount of interference as possible, mostly to avoid the chance of any artifacts entering into your image scene. So if you can get away with a weak filter when you start encountering problems like we exemplified earlier, use the weak. Save the strong for the really, really tough situation. If you want to make a video of the image stack, you can use our, our 3D visualization window to create an AVI that shows um, the image being rotated in Z, uh, with or without the reconstruction um, that you may have done in Neuralusta or Stereo Investigator at that time. You'll see examples of this a little bit later on. We're asked if the system can do a montage of 3D stacks, and that is correct. That, we call that virtual tissue acquisition. So when we refer, we, in fact, we just did. Um, we started a virtual tissue acquisition before we paused for these questions. So we set up a total of four image stacks, so four fields of view being stitched together um, through the section thickness to create the virtual tissue. We'll see that in just a minute. Someone asked if this technique can be a replacement for confocal microscopy. And that really is what the strategy of structured illumination is all about, to create a confocal-like image at a lower cost. The confocal imaging is going to scan a whole scene at once. Structured illumination strategy we're showing here today is going to spend a little bit more time capturing each image. Uh, we're, we're capturing a minimum of three images per final confocal-like session. That is the trade-off, but it is much cheaper than, for example, a laser scanning confocal system. Uh, we're asked also what the maximum thickness for a virtual slice or virtual tissue can be attained using the apatome, and that's going to be uh, determined by your imaging needs and the, the depth that your uh, ob objective can uh, visualize. So you need, a, um, you need to be able to focus all the way through the section thickness with staining that penetrates all the way through in order to get a high quality uh, virtual tissue acquisition. So you could do it at 20x or you could do it at 100x and it's really going to be limited by what you need to see 
and uh, what objectives you can use to uh, make that acquisition. Do you want to show what we've got? Okay, so the virtual tissue has finished acquiring. Let's uh, return to Stereo Investigator and see how it looks. Just going to clean up our collection of images here. Here's a small virtual tissue. This is a two by two, so a total of four stacks. I'm going to back out a little so you can see the whole thing. There are four planes in this image. We can navigate through them by using the page up down keys on your keyboard. And here we go. There's your virtual tissue. Uh, four by four, four planes deep. Acquired yeah. at 63x. So go to one to one and show them what this cell looks like. Oh, man. Yeah. While we're on this image, I want to show a tool we have called Image Adjustment that you can use to change the appearance of your acquired images. As we mentioned earlier, you do lose a significant amount of dynamic range when we strip the out-of-focus light from the image. But you can change the appearance in several manners. You can use the brightness control. This adds light to your image or subtracts. You can change contrast by adjusting your slider controls. You can go back to your original settings by clicking the reset button. You can grab this little white triangle here. We'll change the white point of your image. This impacts how much we stretch your available dynamic range across the full amount. You'll see as I drag it to the right, there's less stretching, and your red channel will start getting darker. It'll be more obvious if I turn off the other two channels temporarily by unchecking them in the display column. That's a little too dark. I'm going to back up until I start seeing the detail that I want to see. You can also adjust gamma of your image by grabbing this little square box, pulling it up and down. Down, you'll clean up your image a little. Up, you'll brighten. I'll turn back my other two channels and show you what the image looks like without adjustment. Quite a bit darker. But if we go back to the automatic stretching the Apatome software did, you see we have a nice final image. We also have an example of a larger virtual slice for you to look at. I'm going to drag two virtual slices onto the application. One captured in wide field mode, one in apatome mode. I'm going to load them individually so they'll be on top of each other. That's a version 10 feature, by the way. They're rather big, so they're going to take a little bit of time. Here you have an opportunity to adjust image scaling. We don't need to do that right now. It is stored in the file. I'm 
going to back out a little so we can see the whole slide. Using the macro view window, I can get a bird's eye view of where I am in relation to the image itself. I can also use this to navigate the image by clicking on the window. Here is the wide field version of this virtual slice. I believe this was 10 by 15. Yeah. Acquired at 20x. Now I'm going to toggle on and off the wide field virtual slice to demonstrate the improvement with the apitome, which is sitting directly underneath this image. We've bought a whole lot of clarity here. We can navigate in, doing a marquee zoom. These guys are pretty neat. Now the wide field version. All the haze has been blown away. We've captured images as large as entire sections, 30 microns deep. When you have an image stack, you can also create projection images that are helpful for presentation or um, for publication. In this case, uh, here's just two options. The maximum intensity projection, in which all the brightest pixels from the stack rise to the top when the image is flattened. And so you get a lot of, of each individual channel's brightest pixels come to create this component image. Contrasting that is the deep focus, which highlights the areas of greatest contrast. This might be particularly useful when you have very punctate regions of the of the set of the a particular label. You can choose which uh, which uh, projection you like and save them independently of the image stack. So now that you have Apatome images and image stacks, how does that affect your uh, data collection? In Neurolucida, if you're doing neuron tracing, here's an example of a neuron that has been imaged both with the Apatome and then in wide field mode. And you can see in this uh, maximum intensity projection that many of the same structures that are apparent in the Apatome image are visible in the wide field image. But as soon as you look at the image volume, you can see that a lot of clarity quickly goes away in the wide field image. Tracing this through Z is going to be quite difficult. The clarity that you obtain by removing the out-of-focus light at the time of acquisition by using the apatome can make the process of reconstruction a lot easier. You can reconstruct either manually using Neurolucida or as we did here, we used AutoNeuron in interactive mode to trace the soma automatically and then interactively trace the dendrites. If instead you're a stereo investigator user and you're, you're doing cell counts, again, we acquired an image stack in wide field mode and then with the apatome in the reflected light path and we're going to compare the differences. So we, we have two cells that are interacting with our dissector Again, in, from top down, it looks pretty clear that we have two cells in both situations. When we rotate this, and this was done using um, 3D solids in the automatic counting module, the, uh, you can, by removing all of the out-of-focus light, you get rid of all of this haze that happens with a bright soma. And so making that decision about where the cell top comes into focus within your dissector can be a bit easier using an apatome or structured illumination. So here, I think it's easier to identify the cell top in, in the apatome image than in this big um, wide field image where the soma is casting such a broad halo.
want to just highlight one other way to use uh, images that have been created in Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida. The Gene, Paint, the Gene Brain Project at NIMH is uh, headed up by Chip Gerfin. And it's an imaging database of pre-recombinant mouse lines. These are virtual tissue images of an entire hemisections of mice that are then created into a maximum intensity projection and published on his website. So again, you can see just the difference in, in the different recombinant lines very easily by looking, you know, a picture is better than a thousand words and you can see what the difference is. You can zoom in in his website and look at the expression patterns in the different mouse lines. So we've only briefly touched on some of the things that you can do for analyzing the image data that you've created using uh, the Apatome device, but we're happy to take any of your questions that you have now. Okay, there's a lot of interest in 3D image montaging. In version 10, just to let you know, if you have individual stacks that you've acquired uh, separately, you can, with our montaging tool, actually put them together and create a montage uh, from those individual stacks. In contrast, you can use the virtual tissue module in Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida to acquire the images and stitch them automatically so that you don't have to do any image alignment at the time. So we were asked if you can export stacks to other uh, image analysis programs, and the answer is yes. Uh, we provide lots of different options for file types. You can save the images and image stacks as JPEG 2000 files or TIFFs. And we also offer a couple different versions, flavors of those file formats. We have an MBF JP2 and MBF JPX. Those are for images and image stacks. And those um, allow you to uh, retain any image adjustments that you do separate from the image data. So it's just applied to the image data, allowing you to revert to the original image data at any time. If you want to bring these image stacks into a different image analysis program, as long as they can support the image file, you're good to go. We're hopeful that version 10 will be coming soon. Uh, we expect it shortly. So keep your eye on the website. We'll let you know when it's coming. In the next couple of weeks for sure. Okay, I want to thank you guys very much for your attention, and I hope that uh, this was an hour well spent. Thanks very much for joining us and, and check us out and email any questions that you have to us at info at mbfbioscience.com. Thanks again.